The Bible reading today uh, comes from Matthew chapter 11 and it's verses 1 to 24. Uh, You can find that on the screen uh, under uh, the heading for this page in this service or it'll be in the outlines you've printed off or you can follow along in your Bibles at home. Uh, As we read this passage, let me draw your attention to the comments box down the bottom of this page. Uh, Please put any questions, comments or feedback you'd like in that box and I'll endeavour to get back to you as quickly as I can. But let's turn to our Bible reading, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 24. When Jesus had finished giving orders to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message by his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he's blessed. As these men went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What did did you then go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. This is the one it is written about. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He'll prepare your way before you. I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Anyone who has ears should listen. So what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to each other, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John did not come eating and drinking. And they say, he's got a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's an outline there on your service sheet. And uh, or on the screen, and you can take notes. And as I said before, uh, the Bible reading, you can send any comments or questions or feedback that you might have by using the comments box at the bottom of this page. When Stephen Smith returned to top flight cricket in Australia, uh, well, in August 2019, it wasn't in Australia, was it? Uh, He promptly hit innings of 144, 142, 92, and 211. Now, if you're able to do maths quickly, that's an astounding 589 runs, averaging 147.25. Now, based on what Smith was doing, the public evidence on the record, many started to ask yet again about Stephen Smith, is this finally the next Don Bradman? In fact, ABC Grandstand had a discussion panel in September 2019 Uh, about that very same question and included another man who'd worn that label, the next Don Bradman. It included Greg Chappell. 
That's the problem with cricket in Australia, isn't it? We're always looking for the next Don Bradman. It's the problem, really, across all sports. Someone appears and we ask, well, who's this man? Who's this woman? We look at their deeds and then we ask, could this be? I don't want to dwell on that question about the next sporting superstar at the moment. We can talk about that later. But the whole scenario does raise for us a very clear pattern about getting to know someone. You look at what they do. Identity and what someone does are so closely tied. When what someone does, what someone says, that establishes who they are. Matthew has spent a lot of time showing us Jesus at work. We've seen so much of what he's done. His preaching, change your view on the world because God has seen his king. His teaching, everything that God promised to do in dealing with the cause of this broken world, well, that is here now in me. His healing, a leper, a servant, demons dealt with bleeding, sins, paralysis, death and blindness. We've seen how this sets up the truth about his identity. He comes to bring the outsider in, to reach down, to bring up the downtrodden. He's the good doctor, the Lord, God in the flesh, a shepherd, full of compassion. Matthew has set up this connection so clearly for us as readers. And now as Jesus sends out his closest 12 followers out to start introducing the good shepherd, the good doctor to the world, the identity of Jesus is placed right in front of us yet again. There remain questions. There remain conundrums. There's opposition rising and it's all connected to this very simple question. Who is Jesus? Let me pray. Father, thank you that we can meet in our households this morning. Thank you that we can meet around your word, which is the revelation of your nature and character. Thank you that we can meet Jesus through these words that you have had written down by Matthew. Father, help us to meet him. If we have ears to hear, let us hear. By your spirit, apply it to us. In his name we pray. Amen. On that point too on the outline, uh, Jesus has finished commanding his 12 apostles about their work. I presume uh, that they've now gone off and Jesus continues to do what he's been doing there in verse 1. He's teaching and preaching. His message is very clear. Uh, Remember Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus' message is about a truth. Something is taking place that's changing the whole nature of the world. The kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom has come into this world. God is doing in Jesus what he has promised to do, to roll back sin. That universal human attitude that says, I am God and God is not, that's displayed in our actions. Uh, To roll back sin and all its effects and to replace it with the approval of God, his blessing. It's the overthrow of the human endeavour to be God, the installation of God's king. And Jesus' message demands a very simple reaction to this truth, repent. That's a simple word. That means change your mind, change your understanding of reality. There's a whole new world order that Jesus has come to institute, to put in place. And every human being has got to work out what to do with that new world order. And Jesus is at the heart of it. But someone's puzzled. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message by his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? The last time we'd seen John, he was wandering in the desert of Judea. He was preaching. He was preaching in preparation. He was getting people ready for the coming of Jesus. In essence, he was preaching exactly the same message as Jesus. Get yourselves ready. Reality is about to change. Get organised because God's king is coming into the world. And he encouraged people to be baptised as a sign that their view of reality was changing. It was amazing. 
People flocked to see John because he was like nothing that they'd seen or heard before. Uh, They'd heard about blokes like him. They, They were called prophets, men and women who were prickly people, proclaiming God's word to God's people, calling them back to God. There'd been a long period of no prophets, no speaking, 400 years. God's people were jolted by the appearance of John and they all flocked out to see him like some circus freak show. John did mince his words. He spoke a message that was confronting. Listen to Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. I baptise you with water for repentance, said John, but the one who's coming after me is more powerful than me. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hands. He'll clear his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he'll burn with fire that never goes out. What a message. God's king is coming. God's king will deal with all of human sin. It'll be a moment of fire and judgment, of division, discernment. It'll be confronting. It'll be clear. It'll be final. When Jesus turned up to be baptised by his relative, and John and Jesus were relatives, John recognised him. He recognised that Jesus was the coming one that John had been preparing for. Now, John's in jail. That's what happens when you confront immorality and corruption. And John's puzzled. Look there at Matthew 11, verse 2. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he's heard of Jesus' works, the healing, the preaching, the teaching, all in that hill country around Capernaum, that small triangle around 10 square kilometres. There's a disconnect here for John. If Jesus is the coming one, if Jesus is the one I spent so much time preparing for, the one who'll come in confronting with an immovable judgment, dealing with sin in our Roman occupiers because they're the problem, then why is he healing hillbillies so far from the political capital of Jerusalem? I suspect that might have been what John was thinking. And in his confusion, he's starting to wonder whether Jesus really is the one He was getting people ready for that. There might be someone else. So he sends some of his close followers to ask Jesus that very simple question. Who are you? Jesus' response is very clear. Look at verse 4. Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news, and if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. Jesus' answer is a paraphrase, a combination of two Old Testament descriptions taken from another prophet, Isaiah, of what the world will look like when God does exactly as he promised. We've read them earlier on today, haven't we, from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. They describe a world where everything has been put right as God promised, where sin has been rolled back and God's approval has been brought. They describe a world where God's approval has been bestowed upon it, just as God said it would. The meaning's clear. It would have been clear to John, clear to those who are listening. Look at what Jesus is doing Look at what Jesus is saying. God himself has come to do exactly as he promised. God himself has come to bear and set right the burdens of his broken world. It's a remarkable statement of identity about Jesus by Jesus. And it's borne up by everything we've seen him do and heard him say. It's not separate from reality, but it's rooted and anchored in the very real world that we live in. It invites John and us to look at and examine real people really set right. It invites John and us to listen to real words really spoken. Jesus is everything that God promised to do. Let me say that again. Jesus is everything that God promised to do. That's the evidence for John from what Jesus has said and done. But as the crowd listens and as the followers of John return to him with this comprehensive statement rooted in evidence from what Jesus has said and done, Jesus then turns to the crowd and he addresses them. 
Uh, in that sense, I suspect he's dealing with us. We, we're meant to identify with that crowd as we listen in. Uh, look at verses 7 to 10. As these men went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? Well, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. This is the one it is written about. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He'll prepare your way before you. Jesus turns to the crowd and he speaks to the crowd about John. But I really think he's using John's work as a springboard to force the crowd to deal with the reality of Jesus' identity standing right in front of them. John was not a freak show. John was not a mouthpiece for hire, someone blown about by the winds of public opinion, a man speaking a message of revolution because the people wanted it. John was not a yes man at the beck and call of those in power. John was a prophet, a mouthpiece for God. He was commissioned to get people ready. And Jesus quotes from another prophet in a remarkable way to make his point. He quotes from Malachi. Malachi had been a prophet. He's the last in our Old Testament. He'd stated clearly, we've just read in Malachi 3, that God would send a messenger to get people ready for the coming of God himself to do exactly as he promised, to deal with sin, to roll it back and to bring his approval to a broken world because he'd done that. But did you notice that Jesus changes the quote slightly? Slightly but significantly. He changes a personal pronoun. So now as Jesus quotes it in the hearing of the crowd about John, he's saying very clearly that John was preparing for my coming, Jesus' coming. Now, I'm an art student. My maths isn't great, but I do know what an equal sign looks like. And so Jesus is saying that God in Malachi is equal to Jesus in Matthew. Put simply, Jesus is saying that John has done his job and now God is standing in front of them. Let me say that again. Jesus is saying that John has done his job and Jesus is standing right in front of them as God in the flesh. Now for a bunch of Jews standing in the dirt of Israel, having been brought up on the messages of the prophets, having gawked at John like some sideshow freak, that's a smack in the face. This is no freak show. This is no circus. This is not entertainment. This is not a morality play. This is a fundamental change in the reality of human life in the fibre of this world, God himself is standing in front of you doing exactly as he promised. That's a remarkable revelation of Jesus' identity, isn't it? God himself is here. Jesus equals God. Jesus is God and he's doing exactly as he promised. In fact, that's what Jesus reminds the crowd of in verses 11 to 14. I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and the violent have been seizing it by force for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you're willing to accept it, he's the Elijah who is to come and anyone who has ears should listen. There's a lot in that statement by Jesus, everything from the nature of the kingdom of God through to the nature of prophecy. But let me tell you, this much is clear. The era of John has finished and the greater time is now here. Put simply, everything that John and the whole Old Testament was preparing for has come in the person of Jesus who walked in the dirt around Lake Galilee in that little bit of hill country 
centered on Capernaum. The time of preparation is finished. The time of fulfillment has come. It's not welcome news, though, is it? Look at what happened to John. Look at the rising opposition to Jesus. Look at the slurs and accusations that are now thrown his way. Look at the plots that are now bubbling in order to lead to his crucifixion. The coming of Jesus has created conflict and opposition because no human, I don't like it, no human likes the fact that their own kingdom has been exposed for what it is, a pretender. Remember what we heard last week? As the message about Jesus goes out and the opposition rises, Jesus wants those listening to pay careful attention to what he's saying. It's not just a matter of listening. It's a matter of hearing, of paying careful and considered attention to what is happening in their midst, to the deeds and the sayings and the identity of Jesus. It's a reminder to us as part of the crowd as Jesus will move on to consider the reactions of people to him and John, it's a reminder to us to consider how we pay attention to Jesus and his identity. John's question raises for us the issue of how we understand Jesus, who Jesus is. Many dismiss him outright. He's a fantasy, he's a figment. But that's just to deny the physical reality of history. Some accept him in a reduced way, a good teacher, a misguided teacher, a good bloke, a martyr. But that's to reduce him to nothing because none of those identities bring any solution to the fundamental need we all have. Some accept him but they're disappointed because he doesn't give them what they think he should, like John was struggling with. That's to accept him but then to redefine him in our terms, not on his terms. Instead, we need to accept his identity as it is revealed in what he's said and done. That's reasonable. It's fair. It's appropriate and right. And if Jesus is who he says he is, and there's no reason to doubt it, then this moment, the life, death and resurrection of this man, Jesus Christ, is the turning point of all of human history. Put simply, Jesus is what God promised the rolling back of sin, the bringing of restoration to the world and people broken by our efforts to attempt to be God. Put simply, Jesus is God himself in the flesh come to do what he promised to do. Now, that changes reality, doesn't it? It changes everything from how I consider my wheat bix to how I educate my children through to how I respond to Black Lives Matter protests and the significance of world politics and that list could go on. It changes my personal relationships, my work relationships, my leisure relationships, my community relationships and everything in between. It changes how I view economics, how I view labour, how I view rest. Whether we respond by repentance, as Jesus exhorts us to, as we change our minds because of this fundamental truth about reality, or whether we respond with apathy or anger or dismissal or suspicion, It doesn't change this basic fact. Jesus is really God, revealed in what he said and done, and reality now changes because of him. And so Jesus turns to those in front of him again to confront them about what they've done with this revelation of his identity. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse 16. To what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to each other, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John did not come eating or drinking, and they say, he's a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Your wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Jesus couldn't have been any clearer about who he is. But what have this generation done with it? What have we done with it? Well, the image Jesus uses is brutally sharp. Now, there's a lot of debate about who's who and what's what, but I think Jesus compares this generation to a bunch of petulant children who refuse to play because they don't like the game. John came proclaiming a message of repentance in preparation for God himself to come. They didn't like it. Jesus came as God offering to bind people up, make them whole again, showing them the compassion they need. They didn't like it. 
The truth is seen in their actions and reactions, their rejection of Jesus. It's not a game though, is it? It's not a matter of people being petulant and Jesus just being dismissed. The stakes here are higher than a children's game, aren't they? The stakes here are eternal. And Jesus makes that very clear as he makes a public pronouncement about the state of the towns in which he's worked and in which he's been rejected. Look there in verse 20. Then he (coughs) proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Again, Jesus is very clear. He's come with a very clear message. What God has promised is now here. It's seen in what Jesus says and does. And we must adjust our lives in response to this reality, this new reality. We must repent. To fail to do so is to ignore the truth of Jesus. It's to refuse to repent. And if we reject Jesus, then we'll be left to our own devices. In fact, now that we've heard this truth about Jesus, now his true identity has been laid before us then we are culpable for what we've done with this reality. Comparing the fate of three towns he's worked in and been rejected in to three towns that had reputations for gross immorality, one of them, Sodom, was destroyed. (coughs) Jesus makes a very clear point. To reject Jesus, to refuse to accept him as he really is, is to face a worse destruction. To reject Jesus is to be rejected by God. Matthew wants us to deal with who Jesus truly is. I'm at point four on the outline. He's not the next to saviour of the world, nor is he someone preparing the way for someone else. He's the end point of what God has promised. The commitment to deal with how we have broken the world and ourselves through sin. Jesus is God himself come to deal with our sin and us. Jesus is God himself come in compassion to bind us up, make us whole, bring us back to what we were designed to be. Now, for those who are dealing with Jesus, those wondering who he is and what he's on about, there is a wonderful reassurance in looking at what he does and what he says because the evidence of his behaviour reveals who he truly is, the Lord, the one man, the God in the flesh bloke who's come to deal with our greatest need and bind us up and make us whole again. Now, if you are like John and wondering if he says and who he is goes hand in hand, if you're wondering whether Jesus is the one who can deal with the broken state of the world, if you're wondering, there's great reassurance here. God has sent Jesus to make us whole again. His deeds and his words speak to the truth of that. Don't be shaken. For those wondering about the state of God's commitment, the substance of God's promises, there's a statement of completion here. God has done exactly as he promised and said he would. The preparations have been done. God has done it exactly as he promised. Jesus is the point of everything that God has said and done. That means there's nothing more than Jesus and nothing less than Jesus. That means that in Jesus alone, who he is and what he says and does is the complete answer to all of our brokenness. That means that Jesus is enough. We need no more. But there's also a warning here or a number of warnings. Reality has changed added in Jesus, and we must deal with that. Jesus is revealed very clearly in what he says and does, and we must deal with that. To reject Jesus is to reject God and to accept that you'll face life, death, and judgment on your own. There is no way that you can reject Jesus now 
and then expect God to welcome you when you face him after your death. There is no way you can reject Jesus now and expect that through death your destination is the house of God. The warning is very clear. Jesus is who he says he is. Look at his words. Look at his deeds. We must work out our response and the consequences are massive. Let me pray. Father, thank you that the words and deeds of Jesus have been recorded and that they reveal his identity, you in the flesh, come to do exactly as you promised, to deal with the broken state of this world. Father, help us to deal with that truth and the way in which it has changed reality and bring us to complete restoration in him. Father, help us to offer that to our world, our town and those we know so that they will deal with Jesus and come to completion in him. Amen.